Dr. Naledi Pandu, as always, thank you so much for speaking with us and for making time for SABC News. We do appreciate it. Good day and thank you for the opportunity. Good day to the viewers of SABC. The theme of this year's General Assembly is the future we want, the UN we need, reaffirming our collective commitment to multilateralism, specifically in the context of COVID-19. You said this week at Wits Business School that, quote, we do know from the current state of geopolitics that the coronavirus outbreak is both worsening and ossifying existing global animosities among powerful nations. What do you see as South Africa's role, no less as AU chair, uh, amidst all this geopolitical uncertainty? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, South Africa is a very, very important interlocutor in the uh, global uh, political space in that South Africa has a very strong commitment toward the values that are espoused both in the United Nations Charter as well as in the Constitution of South Africa. In fact, uh, I think we probably are one of the um, rather unique countries in that we almost transposed the contents of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights directly into our Constitution and therefore upholding respect for human dignity, justice for all, and also access to civil and political rights are a very strong platform of geopolitical relationships for South Africa. And I believe are a platform that South Africa promotes within the African Union family very, very strongly and insists upon with respect to the work that we do as part of the United Nations family. Fair we enough, believe Mr. and have seen through um, the pandemic that collective international action is the best approach. I'm, gr I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic, right? COVID-19, you believe, has added a significant new dimension to international relations for all countries. What's, what it's also done is it's, it's highlighted the fault lines in supply chains. It's exacerbated the divides between rich and poor countries, developed and developing. Do you have a plan for how South Africa emerges from this? Because let's be honest, Minister, it was already on the back foot before anyone could spell coronavirus. Well, absolutely. Uh, South Africa was in the midst of quite a very severe economic crisis. Our statistics indicate very, very high uh, unemployment levels. Our economy uh, rests in a country in which there's massive inequality. And so the signposts as to where South Africa should look with respect to economic recovery are very clear. What has been interesting, even as we continue to confront low levels of growth is the resilience of the agricultural sector and the opportunity it offers properly invested in, adequately supported for higher levels of employment, but most particularly for the creation of new enterprises. Because I think it's not just production of food or other products, it's also agro-processing. So we, in crafting uh, a new economic uh, reconstruction and development strategy, have incorporated uh, agriculture as a key part of that strategy. The fault lines exposed uh, inadequacy of infrastructure, particularly public health uh, institutions, but also illustrated that when there's urgency, South Africa had the capacity to respond. We need to react in that way to the development challenges uh, of our country. So uh, certainly the fault lines have been exposed, but the key lesson for Africa has to be, and that includes us, of course, has to be, should there ever be an emergency of this kind, we should not be found in the same position. So I wonder, Minister, to what extent South Africa's diplomatic or, or domestic ills, forgive me, domestic ills, have complicated your work as a chief diplomat, the drip-drip effect of the revelations of corruption in the State Capture Commission, the most recent revelations around uh, personal protective equipment. I recently asked Washington-based political analyst Palesa Morudu about how South Africa's brand is being received abroad, and her response was, quote, what brand? 
So are you feeling the effects of, of, of these staggering levels of corruption in how you are able to articulate South Africa's foreign policy positions uh, uh, abroad? Our foreign policy activity continues uh, to uh, be exercised with due attention to the objectives we've set for ourselves. We are combating uh, corruption. We're doing so very publicly. It's not hidden. I think the South African brand of transparency is extremely important. Had we not had such levels of transparency, we would not have become uh, immediately alert to the uh, corruption that has been exposed with uh, respect to uh, health equipment for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I believe that uh, our government uh, is serious, led by President Ramaphosa in combating corruption. And uh, what we are looking forward to is the prosecution of the wrongdoers. We also carry out proper investigations. We want when we bring people to court, we have charges which will allow them to be placed behind bars. And I think the fact that South Africa is acting is a very important reflection of its seriousness in ensuring that it restores its uh, reputation uh, in the world community and convinces other countries that they need to take similar measures against corruption and other ills. So you see COVID-19 as providing Africa with an opportunity to define a new relationship with the world based on what you call uh, African terms. That sounds marvelous on paper, uh, but the reality is that for Africa to achieve even part of that aspiration, it would need to speak with one voice, remain united while weaning itself off foreign influence, be that through aid, debt commitments, or the continued influence of former colonial powers in certain regions, particularly in West Africa. How do you plan to assert African terms when Africa itself struggles with the cohesion required to be a formidable force? Well, let me give you an illustration of how this might be addressed. President Ramaphosa, as chair of the African Union, developed a very solid African response to COVID. The, a handful of goals. Uh... ...by the African Union Commission and the Bureau uh, of the Union. The uh, leaders decided that they would create a COVID-19 fund to help support those countries that were least able to have an adequate health response. African countries voluntarily put their own funds into that COVID-19 fund of the AU. The second aspect, we created a common African portal through which we could purchase equipment to support our health response. And what we did by pooling uh, our resources and the order book uh, in a very uh, organized manner and creating one portal which is accessed by all African countries and withdraws on goods produced in countries on the continent that are manufacturing some of these products. We were then able to have a common resource that all countries could approach on the web, order online, pay online, and draw from producers in Senegal, Kenya, South Africa, all the participating countries on the continent. What we illustrated was a pilot of what the African Free Trade Area Agreement might look like. That is what I mean on us needing to determine on our terms how we respond to our economic challenges. I don't want to go further into innovation. I believe this is a very important area. We must produce our own health products for treatment. We must look at vaccine uh, production. We're doing so in South Africa already. We're very determined. Once a COVID vaccine is available and we've ensured our scientists, our participants, we are empowering BIVAC, our partially state-owned vaccine production facility, so we've got to look to ourselves mm -hmm. to be producers and not rely on others to produce for the continent. 
Let's move to New York. Uh, you would have been here had it uh, not been for all these travel restrictions as a result of this pandemic. Of course, the UN General Assembly uh, kicks off the high-level week next week. South Africa, of course, has spent uh, the last 21 of 24 months in the UN Security Council. And despite its stated goals of bridging divides infused with the spirit and the example of Nelson Mandela, the reality is that we have a council that is often rendered ineffective by the big powers who are constantly at at each other's throats. Was it a mistake to join and be party to such an undemocratic body where non-permanent members often are left shaking their heads? Well, I think you have to be a part of a process when you're a member of an organization and take up every opportunity to argue, to persuade, to engage. I believe South Africa, in its presence as a non-permanent member, has really played an exemplary role. And there are many issues that might not have appeared on the agenda of the Security Council had South Africa not been a non-permanent member. So this opened up space for us to argue for greater collaboration between the UN and the African Union to highlight the need for peace and security on the continent, to draw African non-permanent members of the Security Council closer together in pursuit of an Africa-focused uh, agenda. I think the most marginalized in the world have had a presence on the agenda of the Security Council at the instance of South Africa and other African non-permanent members We've had greater attention to the issues of Palestine, greater attention to Libya, greater attention to the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we're able to speak closely to those powerful interlocutors uh, you referred to, and sometimes to persuade them away uh, from a position that might be diametrically opposed to one that South Africa and the rest of Africa hold. So I believe you must be party. Uh, to the institution. However, as I argued in the lecture you referred to, we must not rest at all on our laurels. Our prize continues to be the pursuit of reform right. of that very body of the United Nations. Let me, ask you, let me ask you this, let me ask you this, right? The Ezel Winnie consensus is a document now adopted uh, 15 years ago, which seeks two African, at least two African permanent seats with the mm -hmm. veto. And yet African countries and others uh, continue, despite a lack of movement in terms of the reform, uh, intergovernmental negotiations have not moved any closer to any resolution of this long-standing uh, desire to reform the UN Security Council. And yet African countries and other regions line up every year to be part of this body that is not essentially democratic. Is there, uh, is, you know, do these two ideas uh, clash with each other? Well, you know, you have to keep on. You can't give up. The current structure of the Security Council is undemocratic. It represents an old world. It doesn't it, it represent the world as it is today. We need to change its character. It should become more inclusive. It should be more democratic. We need to look at how we make greater use of the General Assembly. And I believe that what we need to do is review the Ezulini consensus and the strategy that we pursued to seek its appropriation by members of the United Nations. We've always insisted as South Africa that we believe we must get to text-based negotiations. And there has been, I think, some attempt to dissuade African countries from getting to that concrete point. But we must consistently, as South Africa, and we do so as SADC, and we released a statement yesterday as IPSA, that this is what must happen. Minister, let's just shift focus a little bit. Would you agree that human rights has broadly been placed on the back burner in the way countries relate to each other? The concept of non-interference 
and sovereignty often trumps the ability to criticize even when it runs counter to what President Mandela in 1994 called an ethical foreign policy. You say South Africa seeks to reposition itself as a consistent moral compass and principled voice of reason in a changing world. What does that exactly mean in the context of human rights? Well, I think uh, South Africa must ensure in any of the bodies in which it has membership that it upholds the highest level uh, of, of values and democratic principles. But really for South Africa to uh, influence uh, other countries toward such a framework, we must ensure that in our own country, we have the highest regard for democratic practices and the highest regard for the enjoyment of human rights by all persons. This is why we are waging a very firm battle against gender-based violence and femicide in South Africa because we believe this is absolutely antithetical to our pursuit of equality and respect for all persons uh, in society, but in the world, uh, in the human community. So I think uh, that what you must do is not have the romantic notion that uh, from your country you are able to change every country in the world, but you must speak to principle, you must advocate it, you must show that you practice it. And if we succeed in these, I believe more and more we will persuade uh, many, many other interlocutors to believe and accept that this is the best way in the interest of development. I would argue, though, Minister, that uh, in international relations for South Africa, we tend to be very vocal about certain country situations, Palestine, Western Sahara, Cuba uh, in the main, but it, it is largely silent in its criticism of gross violations of human rights in its backyard, particularly Zimbabwe. Take us into your confidence and explain exactly what Pretoria's thinking is in terms of how we resolve or assist in resolving what is happening in our northern neighbor? Well, the government uh, is engaged uh, with the uh, government of Zimbabwe, not just at government level. We also have a party to party. Uh, we've begun uh, discussions. Uh, you, I'm sure, are aware that the uh, government of Zimbabwe and its governing party are saying there are no problems uh, in their country. And uh, we are arguing that actually there, there are difficulties because we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Zimbabweans in South Africa, many of whom indicate they're here because the situation of economic progress is dire in their country. And so we do think there is a basis for us to have a collaboration to see how we might assist uh, Zimbabwe uh, to achieve uh, economic recovery and a level of stability that allows the people of Zimbabwe to feel they're able to return to their country and contribute to its development. Um, but that can only happen when the government of Zimbabwe openly says to South Africa, we do think uh, we should have a conversation about development. Uh, we cannot impose ourselves on anyone. And when I say that, uh, there are many commentators who believe uh, I am uh, running away from a direct uh, uh, intervention. But um, when we uh, have sought help, we've openly gone out and said, look, we have a problem in this area. Could we talk to country X or organization B and look at how we resolve our problem? It's only when you reach that level of openness and admission that you begin to address challenges that confront. Could you be more publicly critical of what's happening in, your, in, in the northern neighbor? Well, we have. I mean, when I indicate that we are ready uh, to have a discussion uh, in, through which we would provide any assistance required, but when a, a leader says there are no problems, who am I, a mere minister uh, of international relations, to say, well, uh, Mr. President, uh, I know rather different. It, it's just not done. It's, uh, it's not diplomacy. 
Well, I have a few more questions for the Mia, Minister of International Relations. Uh, Minister, did the South African government have inf any information? Did you personally know about any threat to U.S. Ambassador Lana Marx before the Politico story broke at the weekend, quoting U.S. intelligence that Iran was planning an assassination attempt. What have you made of that revelation and have you spoken uh, to the U.S. envoy to Pretoria? No, um, once we have uh, uh, an indication, in, and it was in the public domain through the media that we got this indication, we would uh, liaise with our colleagues in the police service who provide the security uh, uh, detail at the various embassies throughout uh, South Africa. We also uh, would speak to my colleague in state security and ask them to take a closer look at the matter. So I understand, as they have indicated through a public statement, this uh, matter is, is being looked at. Uh, I believe there have been meetings with the uh, ambassador, but it is a matter of the protection services and that which is provided to our diplomats. We have assured them through the statement of Minister Jojo that South Africa believes diplomats in our country are safe and should there be a need for additional measures, these will be taken. And obviously we will ask and uh, Minister Jojo will probably seek uh, more information from her colleagues in the security sector in the United States. Uh, but uh, it, it's been a very strange uh, uh, you know, public uh, uh, statement and of course, our friends in Iran are as surprised as we were. So just to confirm, you did not get a heads up from the intelligence services in the United States that this was a concern of theirs. You learned of this from the Politico story. Yes, as, as Minister of International Relations, yes, I can't answer for my colleague uh, in state security, but certainly yes. But you say it reeks of something. I'm saying I, I find it surprising. Uh, you know, why would Iran, uh, being a very good friend of South Africa, come and commit uh, a horrendous uh, uh, act uh, in, in a country which has been a good friend to, to, to Iran? I, and uh, of such a nature, it just, uh, you know, I can only describe it as bizarre. And let me stop there. Final question for you, Minister. Under South Africa's chairship of the African Union this year, the theme, silencing the guns by 2020, fell firmly into your lap, coupled, of course, as we all know, with COVID-19 and all the ramifications that came with it. So my final question is a simple one. Are we going to silence the guns this year? We continue to work towards that. We engage our colleagues uh, in Libya, which is uh, one of the areas we're deeply concerned about. Of course, the uh, insecurity we've seen in Mali has really intensified uh, the insecurity in the Sahel region. Um, so we are very, very uh, worried, but uh, we talk to the colleagues all the time, persuading the various parties to meet with each other, to seek uh, a negotiated outcome. We uh, tell colleagues we've met parties of all sides uh, in Libya, our hope had been, along with the leadership of President Sassoum Weso uh, of Congo Brazzaville, uh, that we would make headway with Libya. The uh, pandemic prevented us from getting together in the way that we had anticipated. But we've not been sitting on our laurels. We continue to be engaged and to be very active. Dr. Naleli Panda, always good to see you and thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you very much. Now, Lady Pandor is South Africa's Minister of International Relations and Cooperation and has been in that portfolio since the end of May 2019.